I like, uh, I think originally when you pitched the idea uh, for this conversation, I was like, oh, yeah, 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 I'll do, I'll talk about comedy stuff. And then, like, the more that I thought about it, the more it felt like going, th- like, reviewing a breakup, you know? And you're just, because uh, you never really wanted it to end. And, but you know that you were not your best self while you were in it. And the other person wasn't their best self. And you're just like, uh, I'm glad we did it. But dang, I I wish we could have done it differently. And so it felt it felt more sad than uh, exciting, you know. Mm. Um, So I was thinking of I was like, what else uh, did I do uh, during that period of time? And I realized uh, that I had completely forgotten about a brief career as a free music critic. Um, And I figured that might be fun to kind of dig into. Wait, what are you saying right now? You just walked up to people and be like, hey, this is what I thought about your set. Let me give you some notes. That's not like a position. That's just a a dickhead at a bar. (laughs) No, no, like, um, uh, I, there's a, there was a publication, uh, in Chicago, like an, or like, it's hard to like categorize these things cause they are just blogs, um, mm. but they have editors and, and shit like that. And so it's a little less, um, it feels bigger time than it actually is. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you don't get paid for any of it. And so there was yeah. one in Chicago called Pop Matters. Uh, and then my, my best friend from high school also had, uh, one called surviving the golden age. And, uh, I would just write reviews of albums and do interviews, uh, for $0. Um, but like it was, I don't know. It was like a weird it's like a weird view into like the machinations of the music industry uh, because I'm like still on these mailing lists of like distro, <laughs> you know, like labels are like, oh yeah, we got the new album coming out. Uh, give it a download here. You know, listen to it, write about it. And it's Are like, these people from the 1930s? <laughs> <laughs> They're all just old tiny people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> listen here. <laughs> Um, oh, the new wax cylinders yeah. are dropping, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's like uh, this weird, like, I'm not qualified to actually be writing about this. And you're giving me this album for free because you just want someone to write about it. Uh, and you're not necessarily like... There's no discerning taste uh, involved on either side, really, because I, I would... Uh, review things that I normally wouldn't be listening to and then uh, trying to like form opinions about these things uh, that I didn't know anything about, Uh, which when you're doing that in a conversation, you can kind of like skate by and uh, generally someone will say something that is true about a topic and then you can kind of just be like, (laughs) yeah, uh uh-huh. Uh, and it's like, yeah, we both saw that movie, right? Like, uh, <laughs> I think but, um, Neil Postman calls this opinionating. Mm-hmm. Like, you've never thought about it before, and here you are. You've been given this moment, and you're like, oh shit, no, what do I think about it? <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. I put it down. It goes yeah. down somewhere. <laughs> That's a hundred percent what it was. Uh, I like. Uh, there was this one. Uh, uh, it was funny. Brian recently sent me uh, a Stereo Lab playlist from nts and he was uh he was like yeah you know stereo lab's fucking great and i was like oh i have never listened to these folks ever in my life uh and i was listening to it and i was like holy shit like i am really into this and then i looked up the band and i realized uh that uh i had written a review (laughs) of one of their like solo albums Mm-hmm. And I went back to the review and I was like, what the fuck did I possibly like? I had no clue who this person was or what their music was historically about. Uh, and I read the review and it was like, 
I was positing this fucking expertise, and I was like, as real fans know, you know, and it's just like, are you fucking <laughs> So do you have these on a file somewhere? Did you like just Google the album in your name or like how did you remember that you had reviewed that specifically or that band? <laughs> uh, I just, yeah, looked up Pop Matters, Dan Dirks, and then um, Stereo Lab, and I found the... As, the as in a bit aside, or like are you now in like a kind of semi-alcoholic relationship with the world where like if you meet someone you kind of have to do a set of activities to find if you've wronged them in the past. So any new music that you encounter, right, you're like, Google, yeah, like, you're like, you know. Pop Matters, Dan Dirks, band name. <laughs> <laughs> and see no. if you have any. <laughs> well, that was, that was kind of the thing is that like, I also wasn't interested in like criticizing anything. Yeah. Like my favorite part of doing these, um, yeah, these weird assignments were the interviews because you can, just kind of like engage with the person and you can follow a line of inquiry rather than having to come up with some kind of like summarizing statement about their work uh, because they'll, they're right there. They can do that. And all you have to do is just ask questions and be curious. Okay. This is the first paragraph of this review. Right, go. I have, and, and to this, at this point, I had never listened to stereo lab and I, uh, was just getting into synthesis. Wait, this how is old 2014. Were you? Okay. Uh, 2014, so I was six years younger than I am. I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah. that. laughs> right? It was a simpler okay. time back then, you know? Yeah, yeah, totally yeah, different yeah, yeah, era. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was 27. So this is right before Saturn returned, right? Um, Cool. Stereo Lab has a definitive place in the landscape of modern music. They spawned the indie electronic movement that caught on stateside in the aughts and has come to shape our current popular culture. Analog synths are now casually mentioned in car commercials. The Arcade Fire won a Grammy. LCD sound systems sold out Madison Square Garden. Hell, Jens Lechman sold us an Amazon Kindle. The history writes itself, and Letitia Sadier, I don't know how to pronounce her name, the authorial voice of Stereolab is deeply entrenched in the citations. Wow. Like, this, this is fucking bullshit, right? I mean, like, it, well, but it sounds to me like uh, you're getting caught up in maybe not even like a bad way. I don't want to like poo-poo it too much. I see some positive in it. You're getting caught up in like this... Um, the sound of someone else's writing. This voice is like uh, Hunter S. Thompson voice or something. I don't sure. know. Like it the repetitions. Probably... Yeah, yeah, like yeah, that. yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, if, if it was, it's a canned set of like terms, but it, like if that's the case, it's kind of like a chunky soup version, you know? It's not like a, it's not like a milky, brothy thing <laughs> of like word soup, you know? It's, a, yeah, it's not the milk steak of word soups. It's got some, it's got some uh, jelly beans in it, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's a, a word soup made by a child. <laughs> no, but I think it's really hard to write something without someone else's tood coming through. Like, I remember trying to write things, and it just came out like uh, Gen X snowboarding commercial nonsense. And I'm like... <laughs> This isn't uh, what I actually think at all. Well, it's an affectation, yeah. Like, it's an it, affectation, it's like, thank like you. The, yes. the language of criticism or the right, language right. of critical analysis is of mm. this, like a, like a, a hyper-contextualization device. Mm. Like mm. this is this music and its place in the world, and it is meaningful because of these connections that I have just outlined for you in this specific kind of language. I do kind of wonder what the... Like, what is the motivation? Because I, I don't think I came out of this better understanding why you write <laughs> about music, you know? <laughs> Wait, whose motivation? Your motivation? Yeah, yeah. Like, the, the motivation of the, of the curator, I guess, right? Because, like, in best case scenario, you're curating the experience of listening to someone else's oh, curation mm -hmm. of their experience, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but you're right that there's this, there is like a way of talking and a way of writing that is in this like, yeah, art criticism 
or analysis thing. No, but you were doing it in, a, in quite a cool way because you uh, mentioned car commercials. You know, oh, and that's that's the cool part. Of <laughs> it, that. it is, <laughs> it is, because you throw in a little bit of like a thing that doesn't matter, or like right. uh, a bit of not pop culture, but like it's permeated down to this. You know, yeah, down sure. to even this. I don't know. It was like there was oh, a pizza or some fries, and it's like, oh damn, I didn't know we were doing all that. You know, is that what you mean? <laughs> you don't know what I mean. No, I, no. I, I don't. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. <laughs> So, does it hold up? Uh, oh, like no. upon, like upon, like a contemporary. No, listening that's not to the material. question. Okay, let's ask another question. I'm gonna, well, I'm no, gonna no, come no, on no. But I am kind of interested in like, but that that is kind of the thing that I'm trying to chase down here, which is like, does it hold up? And I, I don't know why I did it in the first place. Like, I don't know the <laughs> thing that could possibly hold up. Like. When I when I like look at this, it really it sounds like something I did, and then I had a I went through a coma, and then I came out changed, you know. And I'm just like learning about my past life and like opening <laughs> yeah. boxes in the attic, and I'm like I had kids, you know. <laughs> <laughs> There's a part in a scanner darkly because uh, you know a spoiler, but the book's pretty old now. But um, where he's the movie. And the movie, yes. <laughs> but he's an agent, and he's spying on his own house. So he has yeah. to watch videotapes of his own house. And as he, he walks towards his house to become um, Arctor again, this uh, non, non uh, this agent without any identifying features, marks, names, or anything. Um, he's walking towards his house, and as he becomes Arctor, he starts thinking things like this. And it's it's the uh, titular line comes from from this one like internal monologue where he's switching between these two roles and he's like you know i wonder i wonder who he is i wonder what he does in his spare time what what's he doing when i'm not watching him you know things like this and his brain is so fried from drugs that yeah. it's a it's a believable transition he's speaking about someone else and then very slowly the language turns into first person he's like i you know speaking from arthur's point of view talking mm -hmm. about um where he just came from and like moves into this other life it reminded me of that right away. You're like, I wonder what his motivations are. You know, yeah. if, only, <laughs> if only we can get into the mind of Dan Dirks. I don't know. It's impossible. Well, like, don't you guys, I mean, do, don't you have, like, artifacts from a time that maybe you weren't as, like, or at the very least, like, from a consciousness that you don't currently occupy? And yep. you're just like, oh, this was part of me. Uh, forgot shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it, there's a lot of, I mean, I guess it, if you're kind of engaging and always kind of asking questions and sort of doing stuff, like you're in a kind of permanent state of change, you know? So like anything, you know, a year, two years old kind of feels at a certain aesthetic distance at minimum. Mm. But I think with, with a certain amount of that, there's in addition to or instead of the aesthetic distance, there is that reflects an underlying conceptual distance or, or like a an embodiment distance. Like that person isn't me anymore in terms of who would have made these aesthetic artifacts. Yeah. Um, so I kind of feel like there's like um, some sort of like ramp of that, that, like it kind of gradiates away that way. I don't know if you find the same. Yeah. Um, that might be a good argument for just making stuff anyway. Mm. And I'm just thinking like, and like if you're paralyzed in a process and you can't actually make something for whatever reason, because you want it to come out really, really perfect, or I'm going to make so many revisions that, you know, I want to just get it right. Oh, I, like I'm, I'm doing a lot of like sequential artwork and um, it's, it's like, I'll have drawn things maybe last month. And it's like, no, I have to go back and fix that thing. And it's always mm. going to be that. And as I'm drawing, like a mark won't come out well and it's like mm. how, how important is that and am i gonna log it or not but in the moment it's constant little micro fuck-ups mm. um so yeah anyway this is an argument for maybe ignoring that part of your critical brain because it's not gonna be the best thing you've made later so if that's mm. what you're wanting to do just get past that that's not even possible like you're not going to appreciate this for all time like you're going to look at this and be like oh yeah no it was cool for then and then what you're doing now 
um, I found to be the case, it's going to be much better, like, or you're going to like it more. Yeah, I was uh, talking with uh, Tyler Edders about that kind of like recency bias, uh, that like the, the last thing that you've worked on is the best thing that you've done uh or you know rather than something you've done in the past which i yeah i like that idea of framing the moments of current paralysis to just be like you literally will look at this in a year and a half and be like i made that oh shit i didn't i forgot and the 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 exercising that muscle of struggling with your own either like your own internal critic or your taste or your, uh, you know, anything deeper than that, your, your value and the things that you ascribe to being able to pull off art, you know, uh, are, are really meaningless because they aren't going to be the things at like, a uh, 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 meeting those things where they ask you to meet them won't make the thing more memorable. That's true. Yeah. I came, um, I came to some of these kind of realizations during a year where I was like making everything that I hated. And so I wouldn't make very much at all. Um, (laughs) But within it, I was like listening to other artists speak about their work. And um, I'm like, okay, so these three things are actually separate from one another. One is how um, you feel about the work. Like, so if someone speaks very highly of what they're doing or not is completely separate from the quality, quote unquote, whatever that means in art, it's like totally different. You might hear someone um, like go on and on and they think very highly of what they're doing. And it's like, oh, this, like I've had that experience a lot, mm. which is then again, separate from uh, a promotional aspect to it. Like that's a third thing, but separate and not part of this conversation at the moment. Yeah, I guess like I'm curious to, is that the point when something becomes shit that sucks, right? Like, is is that the point that you are transitioning what your deal is? I don't think I can imagine anyone when they're like living something that they are passionate about and that they're creative in, uh, and people give that up though. They just stop doing it. Uh, and I don't know what that break point is or like where does the persistence or the um, resilience kind of like just drop off and you're just like, yeah, I'm not interested in this anymore or interested in struggling with it anymore. Well, I can answer that for myself. It sounds like that's a question Dan Dirk should be asking Dan Dirks. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, I'm just curious about you guys. I mean, and you're talking about this now. Like, it's interesting hearing some of the language in terms of framing the the now of what we're doing or not doing now as it's relevant to the past or our future selves. As in, like, it's some measure of goodness or quality or whatever if what I'm doing now will be somehow meaningful to the me of a year or two years or mm. whatever from now. Whereas that, I mean, for one, that person's a different person, generally speaking, but the the metric that we apply to that, is it like, will it hold up? Will, will I care about this later? Well, I'll tell you what, if that's the thing that's stopping you from making the thing, this is this is the conversation to have with, with yourself. Oh, you're worried about it not being perfect? Go ahead and make the thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, uh, yeah. Yeah. No, go ahead. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I guess it, it's a sort of banal thing to add to that. But I, I guess not all production of work or not all creative work feels good. And like mm-hmm. intrinsically so, like you could be working with for like at a, at a simple level, like a very difficult subject in which it's not going to feel good to engage with that. That's a super <laughs> banal one. But like there might be stuff that like you might still struggle through independently of the kind of material that it's working with. But it can. No, but the kind of thing I'm describing is like reading in a dream. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Like what I, am I doing? Uh, okay, so you were you were doing neither, just kind of ambivalent. But then did you become interested in something else and then ultimately ultimately you're like, oh, that belongs to like past self Dan now or something. Like what actually changed? Yeah. So there was like um I imagine something. Well, here's my hypothesis. All right. Oh, we're gonna okay. Test, yeah. We're gonna get. Um, I imagine something came along that was actually exciting. Yeah. Well, that I think that that's where 
um, the music kind of stuff was kind of working on me. Um, I, but not the like weird, like, uh, speculative journalism. Um, (laughs) but the, the part of that, that I really did love doing the interviews, I think that that Mm -hmm. became the like shiny thing, um, in, in life. And, uh, yeah, I think just exploring music and trying to translate what I had learned about improvisation in a comedy context, uh, into one without words and references uh, and honestly one without other people. Is it insignificant that a lot of what you do, I guess, musically now tends to be solo? Like, is that, mm-hmm. I mean, is, is that accurate actually? I, I think mm-hmm. like a bunch of the stuff I've seen anyways. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I mean, well, no, I, I work with um, my friend Zach who has the Zilch Mouse, uh, yeah. company. Um, uh, he and I have improvised together, um, for years, but we just never commit anything. Like we did, a, we scored, um, a one person show at the annoyance. Uh, and we, that's, that's where I use block party, uh, and kind of like figured out what I really love about, um, incorporating electronics into an improvisational practice. Like we just did eight weeks of uh, an hour long set underneath this bonkers ass show. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. No, anyway. So you were wrong. Yeah. yeah no, no but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but we Double don't commit. Free. Your hypothesis was wrong. You, you, you're the one that was dropping hypotheses. And I was right. Were you? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Published conclusion. <laughs> Confirmed. 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 Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, that's it. What is it? Yeah. <laughs> Shit, that sucks. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I, I did have one more question. Um, was your getting into the the free music criticism, which is still a funny thing to say, um, <laughs> was that? Uh, if you can get into the brain of a dog, I mean, if you can get into your former self's brain, yeah. um, was part of it also like you do this because eventually this is going to lead somewhere? Like, like it's this is this is the grind. I'm gonna do this for free, and it's a blog. Mm-hmm. I'm just gonna, you know, like um, like a capitalist kind of like drive Damn. to it. Like this yeah. is the Dan that wanted to make it, and so man, I'm gonna do this. And I'm sure you were doing other things like that, but go. What, go on. what, what was the question here? <laughs> no, I get the question. <laughs> right. were, were your intentions not pure? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. You know? Um, no, I mean, I think like uh, doing this was like the beginning of trying to figure out uh, a, a new identity. Um, mm-hmm. And it was. Uh, I think like I originally thought like, yes, I kind of like was interested in doing some kind of um, music exploration, you know, like I wanted like, I wanted to capture something. uh, And I thought that this was a good way to start capturing it. Um, And like, honestly, yeah, like the, the thing that attracted me most to it was like, the idea that I could, oh no, an ad is playing. Oh my God, why is an ad playing? That was so disruptive. What is an ad ad playing on? I had the (laughs) the site up. Oh, okay. Uh, I was like, man, I haven't used Ableton in a while, but like, (laughs) it just... (laughs) There's like new stories added to it as well. Like... (laughs) Um, no, this is good. I could do another take on this answer to this question. Um, yeah, no, I think, uh, so I think like, yes, the original motivation was, uh, carving out a new identity, but then also, uh, this idea that I could engage with people that were doing the thing I really admired and I really, um, felt, uh, affected by. And so, the reviews were honestly like 
so I had this one for um, the Surviving the Golden Age blog that was uh, uh, for a band called Trust Fund. Um, and I wrote this review and I was like, Adam, I want to give this uh, 10 out of 10. Uh, and he was like, yeah, I don't know. Uh, we don't really do that. And I was like, no, fucking this album is the greatest album that has ever happened. This is Pinkerton 2, essentially, was my like thesis. Um, and it also felt so important. Like that was the whole thing was that I was also like uh, digging into a lot of the corners of Bandcamp, uh, trying to find uh, music that I that felt like you were stumbling on it at a VFW hall show, uh, and to be like, "Holy shit! Like this is the greatest band ever, and they're playing for ten people. This is nuts." Um, and so I found, yeah, I found like a handful of albums and I wanted to, I wanted to practice bottling the thing, that reaction, you know, that like what I'm listening to is literally the most important thing I've ever heard and to write about that and to then hope that the thing that you expressed might find its way back to the person who made the thing. Uh, that was like ultimately the intoxicating idea uh, and the intoxicating motivation. It was like wanting to be seen in in a way that's a bit more direct. Um, because when you listen to like, when you listen to something that somebody puts words to the exact way that you feel and the way that the chords are structured carry that into the part of you that like passed all of your defenses and passed all of your stubbornness to hear this truth about yourself. Uh, when that happens, uh, you're seen in a way, but it's one directional, right? Like you can never reflect that back to the person who made it. And like, you can go to a show, you can scream and cheer and uh, maybe you'll meet them at the merch table and like try to encapsulate in like a 30 second conversation how fucking meaningful the thing they made is to you. Uh, and this ultimately felt like a way to hone that, uh, that experience and, and to, to engage with it in a way that might actually be meaningful to the other, to the person who made the thing that was meaningful. Um, and yeah. So like if anything, that was probably, and like I had a lot of fun doing the, the interviews that was, you know, it was like, cause that was the most direct way to like be on an hour and a half long call with Dan Deacon and to just be like, yeah, what you do is fucking wild. And I want to know everything about it. And I think that those things are supposed to be like 30 minutes long. And I just consumed so much time from like very uh, famous established people, you know, like, which is such a funny <laughs> fucking thing. Mm. It, 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 it feels like a theft. It, it feels yeah. like I, uh, a heist, you know? <laughs> this is going in a different direction than it, than it started. It started off super holes. <laughs> you've gotten into this I'm cannibal, essence, yeah. cannibal vampire. <laughs> well, no, I don't know. But, like, I, th I think, too, like, when you, uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, when you're, like, depressed and you recently have been like, damn, do I just want to, like, fucking die? And then being able to like talk to somebody who like makes cool shit for a while, and you're just like, well, that's worth it at the very yeah. least. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Cool. <clears throat> close, close, close. Trash can. <laughs> delete, delete, delete. <laughs> If you'd like to support the making of these videos, please join our Patreon. The link is in the description below. Thanks for watching.